Mickey Dolenz was the drummer in a group called The Monkees. It was a television series patterned lightly over the British invasion of the Stones, Beatles, and others. He lived in Laurel Canyon with his wonderful wife, Samantha, and we were friends. Every Thanksgiving, Samantha and Mickey would open their home, a wonderful, large, rustic, log cabin-like place at the end of a street called Horseshoe Canyon Road. It may have once belonged to Walt Disney. They would invite people who did not have family in Los Angeles to share the holidays. His television persona was vastly different than the man I got to know. He still tours the country with a group of other artists of that era, and I remember Mickey and our times together with great clarity and joy. One of the things that came up when we when we talked during our television during the television interview was uh, that, y and something that I received mail about from across the country is that you kind of indicated on the TV program that you have a tremendous difficulty disassociating yourself emotionally, mentally, physically from the business, that most of your friends tend mm -hmm. to be show business type people, that you think about it a great mm -hmm. deal, that you feel that that is the major factor in your life. <coughs> we did that show about four <coughs> months ago. Is it still the same way? No, it's changed a bit. How so? Well, <coughs> I had neglected to get into my my science, uh, you know, hobbies, if you will, and and my different uh, appreciations of technology, you know, mm. which which occupy also a large portion of my of my time. And though most of them are media oriented, let's say that I I don't really get involved in too many things that aren't media, you know, oriented. And it's just because I, I I like to be around people that are interested in that, you know, and because uh, as you know, you and I talk about that a lot, you mm. know, and, the, and media is more than show business now; mm. it's information. Mm. So uh, if you, in its grandest sense, you know, I'm you know involved in in information, and I'm also involved in in every, in lots of other things too. But if you were totally, uh, if you were placed in a position where you had total control over programming a television network for a week. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do you think you'd present? I'd probably have Buckminster Fuller on every day. <laughs> yeah, he's my big hero. I'm going to start a fan club for him. I for hope. Bucky? For Bucky. What else? What kind of shows would you like to see on TV? What do you think? Where do you think the media um, is lacking? Well, it's... It's not that uh, it's not that it's lacking, Elliot. Unfortunately, the, uh, you know, there's only so many there's only so many things you can do that people will understand. You know, they have to be educated gradually. You know, you have to learn to add before you can learn to multiply. And like I I say, Buckminster Fuller, and I'd love to have him on, but nobody would understand. The great majority of people watching television, you know, network television, it would be, you know, uh, beyond them. You know, the uh, the concepts, you know, just by, just by the fact that they that they haven't been exposed to no fault of their own. It's just education. It's like if I came on on television and and uh, started talking about quantum mathematics and uh, or uh, speaking in a foreign language. You know, if you haven't learned how to speak in that foreign language and you have no idea what should, what should they're talking about, so go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. But should should television be used as an instrument to elevate the tastes of people or cater to them? Uh. Well, hopefully, uh, uh, a nice balance of both, you know, mm -hmm. uh, catering, you know, in the respect of giving you what you want, which is what catering implies, and also educational. You know, television now is the potential for its for its uh, its use as an information as a tool of information is, is just tremendous. You know, with cartridge and everything. And the problem with broadcast television is the same problem with politics. It's obsolete, you know, and it's just because it's obsolete. Like typewriters become obsolete, but you can't afford to replace all the typewriters all the time. So a lot of people are using typewriters that are obsolete. And, uh, that, and that's the problem with, with, with most of the network is that it, you, it can't change that rapidly without displacing thousands of people. You know, you have to, it has to be just, it just has to be gradual. It has to be a... As gradual a change and as as rapidly, hopefully, as possible, but nevertheless, it has to be, it has to be a, a gradual change. When we return, I'd like to talk with you briefly about your political feelings and the Vietnam War, and a little bit about uh, narcotics also. Do you have any interest at all in politics, in voting, in politicians? 
Yeah, that's a great name for a rock group, Cymethicone. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of that. That's a great name. Yes, uh, I, I'm not a fan of politics. Did I, you vote last time around? Oh, no. No, I... Uh, I haven't voted yet. Uh, ever? No, never. I never even registered. Mm -hmm. Why? <clears throat> it's just a little bewildering, and I'm not. I don't want to get involved until I know what's going on because uh, I just, would re you know, I don't want to be responsible. I guess, and it's. I guess it's a little of a cop out. A little bit of a cop out. But I also have tried to remain objective. And if I ever get into politics, I'll probably buy my own politician. You know, that's the kind of that power. You know, <laughs> get into it from. From that approach, the problem with politics is, as far as I'm concerned, is it, it is obsolete. Like we were talking about, politics before. is obsolete. Talk yeah. about that. <coughs> it's just, it's just that's the only word I can think of um, in a nutshell to to describe it. It's the the methods and the uh, and the manipulations of politics uh, today, as we know it, is just obsolete relative to the way it could be. As I said. Uh, studying Buckminster Fuller and design science and technology and all that. I, you know, I, I I believe that like Buckminster Fuller says, you could send all the politicians to the sun and as long as all the, the power sources and as, all, as long as all the, the functions of the society continued, nobody would know the difference. Hmm. And that's almost true. Unfortunately, you can't just fire all the politicians because you'd have thousands of people out of work roaming the streets, hungry, clubbing people. The same reason you can't um, you can't, f you know, like the same reason I think that, that the war lasted as long as it did is because so many people made their livelihood from that war. Now, they didn't, you know, a guy working in a, in a factory, you know, a riveter again, this guy standing there, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people working in, in, in related industries in the draft board rooms, you know, the secretaries in the draft board. Well, they, all they're interested in, all they can be interested in is their $125 a week to support themselves and their kids and their family. And because if they don't get that, then they, they die at Starvation City. Do you, and do you think that, that that would justify maintaining wars to keep all oh, this course not. Place? No, of course not. Mm. That's, the, that's the incredible conflict. That's the reason I haven't gotten into politics. If you... Because I'm sorry. <clears throat> because uh, of course it's not justified. But what do you? But th what are the alternatives? Uh, other alternatives is finding jo other jobs for these people. But there's not there's not that many jobs around. The biggest problem with politics is that it's just obsolete. It could be so much more effective. I think that the space shot and our our program in space has has really, you know, uh, destroyed nationalism in this mm -hmm. country and in every other country in the world. Um, you know, a 13-year-old child today has never lived when there wasn't space flight. Mm -hmm. Now, growing up in that consciousness, it's difficult to think nationally. Mm -hmm. And that's the big revolution. That is truly the essence of the revolution all over the world, a common revolution. And the reason it's with young people is because they haven't been conditioned to think nationally, and they refuse to... Jack Nicholson once said to me, in fact, in the Bahamas about six years ago, he, uh, he said the problem today is that there's a growing number of people, a great number of people that are internationalists. Mm -hmm. And this world is not mm -hmm. yet set up for internationalism. Just little things, customs and money and, you know, and, uh, and, an ec and economics. Passports. And passports passports yeah. and all that stuff. That's why the common market, you know, I think is hopefully it'll work out and it'll tie that mess together because Europe is strangling, you know, trying to exist as separate little tribes, you know. It's, that's the problem. We're still all tribes, but now there is a planetal consciousness that exists that is caused greatly by pictures of the Earth from space, you know. Once you've seen spaceship Earth floating through the, the void, it's difficult to, to think in terms of territorialism, you know. But that's not, e that's not bad, you know. We had to be territorialistic you know, in our way to exist as long as we did. And now the territory is just a much grander one. It's all, the, it's the planet, you know. And we also have common enemies now. Pollution, you know, and population, they are being recognized. Remember everybody used to talk about, boy, if Russia and America and China had a common enemy, you know, the Martians maybe will come and Michael Rennie will step out and <laughs> Gort will come out and will destroy you unless you shape up. Well, that's, uh, that's what's happening with a lot of the pollution. Let me stop you and give out the telephone numbers, and some people might want to call and ask you some questions, and I'll have some specific questions, too, as we go through with that. One of the things that I didn't, that I didn't ask you before in the interview that I wanted to ask was your feelings about uh, drugs. 
Mm-hmm. Have you used many of them? Uh, have you? Uh, well, you're average. I guess you're more or less more or less publicized. <laughs> just the usual the stuff. Commercial stuff. Yeah. I mean. <coughs> when you were on, when you were doing uh, the television shows of sixteen hours a day, was mm-hmm. there a tendency to to fall into? Uh, Amphetamines or, barbi- or barbiturates? No, I never got into that. I'm very hyper, and uh, the only times that I ever did, uh, you know, no dose, you know, <laughs> even wipe me out, because I just, uh, I'm so hyper that it just puts me right over the. I could probably be a downer freak, you know, except that I just don't. I just avoid it. I, uh, I you know, you can tell I just poison, and you know, I, I drink <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not a drug. I drink as much as you. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's just an occasional random sip. Yeah. We have the caller back. KABC, Elliot Mintz, you're on talk radio. Hi, Elliot. I don't know what happened when we got disconnected. Probably the tap on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, you know, Mickey, uh, I know you, you, would, you don't know me, but um, you and I were in the same gym class. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your name? At, uh, at Wal- yeah, I can't give it over here. can't give it At uh, Walter Reed. But, uh, that, you know, that was when you were uh, doing Circus Boy. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that always interested me, uh, as I recall, you weren't you weren't there very long. No. Uh, did you transfer out, or, or what happened? I went there two semesters, and then uh, that was I, was I was only there for the ninth grade. Yeah, or, yeah, no, that's right, yeah. yeah. Listen, um, what, what impressed me was that uh, or what, what I was wondering about was, uh, to me, to me it seemed as if the other, uh, at that time, that the other classmates were, um, uh, were very, um, oh, what shall I say, they didn't, uh, they didn't treat you very kindly. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Is that so? What, what, what happened? What, what, how did your classmates treat you? In well, as an oddity, you know, as a... Yeah, yeah, right. That's that's the word. I was the token star of the school. Right, and you know, I I always wondered. And I I know that you must have been aware of that at the mm-hmm. time, and I, and I I always thought that was rather you know cruel treatment. But I just wondered, how did you take that? Did you because you were very quiet in in junior high? Yeah, I I uh, I went home and cried a lot. <laughs> no, I mean, was it just inwardly, or or did did this just roll off your back, or what? Well, much of it, yeah, because. Uh, I'd been used to it, you know, uh, uh, just uh, in public in general. But it was tough. It was such a bewildering thing to uh, one day be in the middle of three or four thousand kids. Yeah, just literally yeah. one morning, and, and before that I hadn't ever... Ca- hadn't ever Caller, uh, wh- what's your first name? Don. Don, let me ask you a question. Uh, from your point of view, when, when you knew Mickey in high school... I, I didn't know him, really. We were just in the same class. That's the interesting thing. No one... No one there um, uh, really approached Mickey. You know, he the, the word oddity was was very um, was very appropriate. Did he stru- people just treated him in a very um, uh, as if there was a barrier around him? You know, w- was that intended on your part? Did you did you create a little barrier? Well, around? only in the respect that I had nothing to talk to anybody else about. I didn't know what was going on. I was completely bewildered by social life, you know. Uh, I didn't know that many people <laughs> existed. Don, how did, how did the kids in the, s- in the high school seem to react to Mickey? Did they relate to him as being a snob or, I mean... Th- th- this, this was in junior high. Junior high. How did they relate to him? Uh, well, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think anyone, uh, anyone felt him as a snob. It seemed to be the other way around. No one would, would, uh, no one ever approached him, you know, so that no one, no one would know just how Mickey would react if you, you know, went up to him and tried to be friendly. Hmm. Uh, I, I always noticed that he was uh, very quiet, very alone, uh, and he didn't, uh, he didn't smile very much. <laughs> I just had an incredible, incredible deja vu. I just had a feeling that Ralph Edwards was going to walk in. <laughs> <laughs> Don, thank you very much for calling. Okay, good, good night. Among the the uh, show people that you hang out with and and listening to Army Orchard uh, is, reminds me of the business trip. Uh, who are who are among the nicest? Who are, who are the folks whose whose company in in the record world, specifically singers and the like, who you get along with the most, see most often? Um, probably Harry Nielsen. 
what is it about Nielsen that? Well, we ju we just uh, go back a, a, a ways, you know, quite a ways, because he wrote for the the song for the uh, a couple of songs for the Monkey Show, so we we went through that together, and we have a lot of things in common. Mm -hmm. Buckmin Buckminster Fuller for one, mm -hmm. and uh, so I get along with him very well, and. Um, let me see. Let me see it. Uh, in the record world, that's a. That's about it. Uh, do you tend I to should know the name? Do you tend to spend less time uh, with musicians, in general? Mm, maybe just because I'm. I'm uh, involved in, in my own music, you know. You're recording for MGM and now. For MGM Records, yeah. Mm. And. Uh, as I said, you know, I, I came into the business as, uh, in this particular time as an actor again. Now it, everybody thinks of me as a as a drummer, and I I go under, I go walking down the streets, and some guy will come up and say, "Hey, you're a drummer?" And I, yeah, right. Uh, as a drummer, wow, man, Paradiddle Flam, six four time, and what kind of sticks you use, you know? And I I uh, I don't remember. It was four years ago, you know. And though I, and though I still play the drums, it's difficult because I was excuse me I was remembered for that primarily. Can you ever, d do you think there will ever come a time where you'll be able to leave all that behind you, where people will accept your music and your personality and your being without the, the trappings of monkeydom? Well, not, you know, d I guess as much as they remember Circus Boy. You know, a child star has to live with that, you know. Jackie Cooper. And Upon reflection, would you prefer for it to have not happened at all? Upon reflection, I can't imagine any doing anything else. I mean, you know, just that. I, well, no, I, it's just that I can't. I did it, and there's no way you can possibly say, well, if you'd a if you'd a had a choice, you know, it's impossible to speculate like that. It's the only thing I know, and and uh, that's it. Have you ever considered yourself a very religious person? I asked you this on the TV show, yeah. and your response was interesting. Um, I, b I believe in, in, in belief, in the power of belief, and the particular religion that I study and have studied, it isn't actually a religion, it's, it's called religious science, it's the science of religion, more or less, it's the study of faith, and, uh, and, and, and that interested me because uh, I, I realized at, at a young age that it doesn't really matter what you're believing in, it's your belief in it. That, mm. is, that is the motivating force. It doesn't mm. matter if it's a, a statue or a, a goat or a, you know, or, or anything else. Religion, again, <laughs> the biggest problem with with most religion, is that it too is obsolete. You know, people realize that, that I believe most people realize that God, in his traditional sense, does not exist any more than wind gods and lightning gods ceased to exist. Uh, at a certain point in history, when people realized that wind was not somebody blowing from a mountain, from the great mountain cave of the north, you know, and the lightning wasn't sticks thrown by Thor. Well, to those people, those were their gods. Those, that was their explanation of, of, their, uh, of their surroundings, of the things around them. That was redundant. Wasn't it? <laughs> and uh, our gods today are, in effect, the same thing. It attempts to explain the phenomena that surrounds us, our environment, our universe. And so when what's his, Nietzsche said, God is dead, uh, it's not that he's dead, it's just he's been redefined. Hmm. We have other words for God now, like the wind god used to be, or whatever, I don't know the wind god, what was the wind god? Well, Thor used to be the god of lightning, right? Hmm. Now it's uh, a high energy static area caused by <laughs> two magne you know, positive and negative attractions. So the traditional concept of God, I think, is it's obvious that there isn't somebody up there on a cloud pulling strings and pushing buttons. I think that I believe in, uh, uh, to God, God, what God means to me is just a, a law. Nature is a better word, instinct, those kind of things. You know, and we'll find other names for God. In fact, I think that'll be one of the greatest uh, um, revelations, uh, conscious, consciousness revelations and developments of of centuries will be when we when somebody coins the new word for God for for the energy that that means God like the, the the thing that Adam did for the physical world there will be another word that does for the uh, spiritual and energy world. You said you had a one other thought about God that you wanted to communicate. Um, 
Yes, if he's listening, don't take me seriously. <laughs> no, <coughs> uh, no, it wasn't that. It was that an interesting thing I read in one of my science my science journals was that it's the belief of many educated m men now that uh, that uh, the thought wave is a is just an ultra ultra high frequency of wave propagation, and that soon all these you know these supernatural quote unquote. Um, phenomena, ESP, psychic energy, uh, spiritual this, and will be um, redefined again into uh, more or less scientific uh, terms and, and different forms of wave propagation. And mental telepathy may very well be a reality with the aid of a, of a small scrambling device that is implanted into the side of your head like a Munt stereo pack or something. Do you, or any other kind of story. Any other kind of story. Do you tend to be an optimist? Do you think that the world that Amy Bluebell will grow up into when she's 16 or 17 and 18 is going to be uh, much better than the one we have now? Worse, do you mm. think? Uh, well, yeah, I think it's completely up to us. I think that it's a... I don't not, I'm, I'm not a do? fatalist You're at not. all. No, I don't believe that anything is, is fated uh, much, you know. There's certain exceptions, but... And I believe that it, we are right now creating the, the, the world of the future. It's up to us to, to provide the direction. Um, I, I believe that uh, t our technology, our tools, if you will, in the grossest sense, I believe our tools are the key to our success and, conversely, the key to our destruction if we choose to use them like that. I'm not afraid of atomic war anymore. I used to be tremendously afraid of it because I grew up under the shadow of a air raid siren out in the San Fernando Valley because it was a high-density area for technicians for Pasadena Caltech. So when I was a little kid in 1945, every Friday morning at 10 o'clock, the, uh, the air raid siren would go... Mm -hmm. For three and a half minutes, I go running in the house and say, "Mommy, mommy, what's that? What's that?" And she said, "Oh, it's nothing. Just warning for total atomic <laughs> war." <laughs> and that's a heck of a. Uh, in fact, that's a hell of a consciousness to grow up under. It uh, it really shakes you up. So, so um, you know, uh, when Nixon went to China, uh, I don't really know how much he had to do with it. I doubt if it, you know it was. I'm sure it was a very involved thing, and I don't really, I'm not really interested. Just the symbolic gesture mm. of f at least recognizing the fact that they existed. You know, for all these years we haven't recognized that those three and a half billion people, or whatever it is, even existed. Right? That was the official mm. statement. You know, we didn't recognize Red China even existed. <laughs> well, that's why that kind of took a load off my head. And now that we're selling Russia to, we're selling Russia to wheat. We're selling wheat to Russia, and wheat to China, and obviously supporting them now too because they are uh, backwards relative to us we're s we're surely the most advanced technological you know society the world has ever known and i think that our technology it's the old story about you know uh, a knife can either save a life or take one and uh, that's the key on that note we're out of time i thank you very much for coming down and talking with us i thank you too elliot